welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Campbell. I'm a doula in Washoe County, Nevada, a Medicaid provider, a lactation educator, childbirth educator, and mom of 18. You can find me and connect on doulainreno.com. Remember, give a shout out to those who are brave enough to share their stories with us on how they have become parents. Let's dive in. Welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. Today, I'm here with Kristen Revere. How are you today? Doing well. How are you, Jennifer? I'm I'm great. And I'm so excited to have you on because, you know, talking birth work with someone else is always really fun. And you're in Michigan, so it'll be great to see the differences between Michigan and Nevada. But jump in and share your story on how you became a parent. Ooh. Mm. So where do I begin? Um, I had children late in life. And have a background in advertising sales, political fundraising, and nonprofit fundraising. And when I was pregnant with my daughter, who is almost 14, mm-hmm. she, um, I was working on a governor's race doing fundraising and imagined that it would be simple to assemble my dream team of birth and baby experts, but my friends had had kids earlier in life. I was a stepmom. Um, my stepdaughter was coming on eight at the time. And so it had been a bit since my husband, you know, had a child. And so all, everything had changed and the advice I was being given wasn't mm. up to date And so I ended up switching providers. I didn't feel heard from my um, OB and kept asking around and then learned about nurse midwives and still wanted to deliver in the hospital. But I ended up taking Lamaze classes and, you know, wanted an unmedicated hospital birth. I didn't know what doulas were with the first baby, but hired doulas with my second and became a doula after my son was born. So yeah, so I just really felt frustrated and became passionate about women's health through my Mm -hmm. own experience. Um, to, To make a long birth story as short as possible, I had the perfect pregnancy up until 37 weeks, developed preeclampsia, was on bed rest. And so a lot of my dreams of going into labor on my own and everything I had done in preparation got um, shifted. So I ended up getting induced at 39 weeks. My blood pressure was high, um, protein in my urine. um, So my midwives were concerned. And so I had my membrane swept and had a cervical ripener, Cervidil, and avoided a lot of other interventions, although my daughter wasn't responding well on the monitor. So there was that um, constant talk of potentially having a surgical birth. I had back labor and could have used a doula then, but I had a nurse that came in when she could and helped adjust me. My husband did a great job, but I ended up being able to turn my daughter and Once she turned, I felt the need to push. So my midwife ran in and I had my daughter like three pushes in and she was tiny. So it was, you know, quite a quick process. But I do recall my midwife saying that she had called for a surgical birth. They were concerned about D cells and so that I was very fortunate that I delivered on my own. And so... Then I was excited, of course, having my first child to have the skin to skin and rooming in. And unfortunately, she had glucose issues. So we had a new NICU at the hospital I delivered at. And so she was one of the first patients in the brand new children's hospital. Mm. So that was, you know, later a good experience for me to go through that. But the thought of breastfeeding, you know, from the start when I had to pump and go from my room to the NICU and then go home without my daughter was challenging. So I became even more passionate. And after my daughter was home, I ended up hiring lactation consultants. I went back to the hospital and saw lactation consultants there, hired one that came to my home 
and became very passionate about breastfeeding advocacy. I want, I was successful in breastfeeding, but it took a while because she had an IV enhanced formula was, I was pumping and had 10 minutes in the NICU to try to feed her toward the end. And so it was quite the process. So I started, um, holding breastfeeding events that I helped organize with my background and brought in politicians to speak and music and, and got involved in some local breastfeeding organizations and some doulas were involved. So I got to know doulas in the community. And then right when I found out I was pregnant, my kids are 21 months apart. The doula was my, really my first phone call. Um, and I hired her right upon, um, you know, learning that with my husband's blessing, of course, but he was, you know, a little bit reserved on the fact that he felt like he worked really hard and wasn't sure that he wanted to be replaced. And of wow. course, as doulas, we hear that yep. from partners, like feeling like the doula would take their role. But even though my second birth was very quick, um, and you know, I went two days past my estimated due date and no complications had a few signs early in pregnancy, a preeclampsia, but nothing developed. Um, even it was more of the support that I received in pregnancy from them, the resources that my doula team gave me. Um, I ended up seeing a functional medicine doctor, a naturopath. I saw a chiropractor with both um, births and then took Lamaze all over again as the planner that I am. So yeah, so they were there emotionally for any change that might happen. And then of course, physically, but I um, labored at home as I wanted to, and then went into triage and I was a six to a seven with a bulging oh, bag of water. Nice. <laughs> By the time I got to my room, um, my water broke and I was pushing. So the midwives and the practice I work with had left a month before my due date. So an oh. OB delivered and she came running in. I had, I remember a resident there um, and the resident almost helped with the delivery, but my OB made it in time. And my son was almost nine pounds, so no issues with his health. And breastfeeding was great at first, but I noticed some discomfort. And he ended up having a tongue tie. So I saw lactation consultants and had the tongue tie revised. Um, so yeah, so I ended up needing breastfeeding support both times mm -hmm. and had mastitis. So I learned a lot. And during that second pregnancy, I had signed up to begin teaching classes. I thought that I would teach them as a hobby and be able to help more families. And then my students wanted me to become their doula. Mm -hmm. So I took a doula training in Florida and thought that I would, you know, just take a couple students a year, but I attended my <laughs> and fell in love with it. So yeah. the rest is history. I I mean, how great. I love it when I get clients on their having their first baby who realize that there are such things as doulas and what we do and how that can be helpful. Lately, I've had two dads who were like, we need to get a doula. I can't go this alone. And I was like, Yes, this is great because most of us get into birth work because we have a first child. And even if it goes well, like my experience was really hard, but went really well, right? Yours was really hard, but ultimately it was okay. And we realized yeah. how much we lacked, how much better it could have been if we just had the proper support, even if we don't know what that means. Um, like lactation is, is more readily available and makes more sense, but to, to know what a doula is and find a doula and want a doula. I'm always so excited when it's first time moms um, because Same. they're, they're getting that information on the front end. They don't have to go through a traumatic situation to realize that it could have been different and it wasn't because it's now it's too late. So exactly. I, you don't I get love a do over that. of that no. first birth. And 
there can be trauma. And if you don't have that support, I mean, we have well-meaning friends and family, but they are not trained to fully help you process no. um, the birth the way a doula can. And then of course, referring to a mental health therapist who's trained yeah. in perinatal mood disorders and um, also in, you know, post-traumatic stress. I love doulas are at, in the beginning when I went into it, I didn't realize the volume of resources that we would have and need to give out. I, I know a pediatrician friend of mine was a pediatrician before she had kids and used to think like, why are these parents asking me all these things? And then right. had a child and realized, cause you're seeing the pediatrician, you don't see your OB for six weeks. If you don't yeah. have a lactation consultant or a doula, like you're kind of winging it alone for quite a long time considering the postpartum period, you know, six weeks. And she was like, oh my gosh, and now I understand why parents are asking me because I, I have no one. I'm a pediatrician. I have no one. And became a better resource for parents, which is great. That's wonderful. But it's interesting the in the postpartum period, even the pregnancy period, those 10 minute appointments with a it's different person, sometimes we're not, they're not getting any information that's valuable. Right. So even if you come up with a list, you're prepared and try to utilize every second of that time, it's still not enough. No. And postpartum, I mean, I always tell my clients, I can tell you what this first three days is going to be like the cluster feeding at day two, the fact that everything in your body is sore. Like I didn't know I had a, I pulled a muscle in my armpit. I didn't even know I had one oh, there. Wow. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're pull, you're using every muscle in your body and you hit like three days postpartum, your mature milk comes in, everything in your body is sore. You're now very sleep deprived. You have the equivalent of a hundred birth control pills running through your body a day. Absolutely. And, and they're very alone. That's why day, th that day three or four, I'm always there because I know I leave that you leave them on the highest high they've ever been on. And day three or four is not the highest high. Right. Uh, I want to know, I love your business. I love what you were doing before and how you tied that into all the breastfeeding events and stuff. That's really phenomenal. And then you became a doula thinking, oh, I'll just wing it every once in a while. <laughs> But then it doesn't you, work that way. <laughs> I mean, not really. Not if you keep having your own kids, you kind of ebb and flow, but no, not really. So tell me how your business progressed. You've got a book, you've got a podcast, your website's outstanding. Um, you're doing a lot in the community. So take me from that second birth and your doula training and doing it like one or two a year to now, because that, that's been a long time and a lot of change. Yes. So I ended up working with the doula collective that mm. I hired for my son's birth. And so I it was a doula with them and taught classes under the collective. And then I found that the clients who were attracted to me were not seeking out that collective. Again, I came from okay. a professional background. Um, I tended to attract the business type. And that collective was more home birth focused. I don't want to use the crunchy word, but they <laughs> were yeah. a, a different personality. Although I loved them as my doulas, the clients they were bringing in were not interested in working with me necessarily. So I went on my own and started a solo practice, but then realized that it wasn't sustainable for me as a solo doula to you know, I was missing holidays, my son's birthday. Like I wasn't able to travel or plan anything because I didn't want to let my clients down, even having doulas back me up. So I wanted to introduce the shared call model for birth doulas to my area. There were not any doulas um, with that model of care in Grand Rapids area. So I talked to a hypnobirthing educator, a friend of mine who was also a birth doula, and we started Gold Coast together in mm. 2015. So she had her own practice. I had my own. We were each teaching different classes and we combined forces and she lived on the lake shore about 30 minutes from me and I lived in the city. And so we decided we wanted to serve 
um, all of the lakeshore communities in our area, as well as Grand Rapids. And we're the first dual agency in our area. And we were birth doulas, but wanted to bring postpartum doula support mm-hmm. to the forefront. So we brought a trainer to the area and we had a full class of postpartum doulas, including ourselves. And then we ended up, um, you know, having postpartum doulas work for us from that first training and then did a lot of education because people didn't really know what postpartum doulas were. They barely knew what birth doulas were in 2015. Yeah. Yeah. So, Still, and we, also, yeah. Yeah. And we had childbirth classes, um, breastfeeding classes, lactation started small. There were six of us total. And then now I have 26 contractors. I'm now the sole owner. My original business partner had moved out of state for her husband's job. And one of the doulas who attended our first postpartum training ended up um, buying into the business. And Alyssa co-hosts the podcast with, with me, we have the becoming a mother course, and she is a sleep consultant with us and teaches our newborn class, but she's no longer owner. And we have the book supported your guide to birth and baby together. So we're still very involved, but she's now in real estate with her husband and has Mm -hmm. other passions. You know how it goes with doula work. Sometimes you just need to fill your cup in other ways. And so Yeah. So that's where it stands. And we serve um, as far as overnight postpartum support. That's our core focus of the business. We serve all up and down Lake Michigan. So Southwest Michigan, Northern Michigan, as well as West Michigan. And then for birth support, we only cover that 60 mile radius Mm -hmm. of Grand Rapids. I totally understand, Uh, you know, I, when you have births on your calendar and you think you do, like I do, I like four a month. Yeah. Um, And, but I don't drink if it's getting close to due dates because I don't want to get a phone call and be tipsy. Um, I can't even plan a weekend. I have a daughter that lives two hours away um, outside of Sacramento, California. I can't even, I won't go drive there to see her, to spend a day with her, because if I got a call, I need to be at the hospital within, by two hours, the two hour mark. So, you know, I don't think people realize how tied we are in a lot of different ways when we're seeing clients and that, you know, if you think about how much you want to make in a year, yeah, a lot of us to replace a corporate job And then, you know, you divide that into 12 and then you divide that into how much you charge per client. And you really like, I'd have to see six clients a month to make the amount that replaced my income. And that means 12 months. You're never taking a break. You're never going anywhere an hour outside of where you live approximately. Um, Every time we go and do something like my car and and I don't mind this, not all of this is a complaint, but like my car is packed with two doula outfits, my birth kit. We, we have to take my vehicle everywhere, or we have to take two vehicles everywhere in case I have to leave for a birth. It's things like that. And then I'll do a consult and they say, so you're on call 37 to 42 weeks, but what if something happens before that? And I'm like, it's actually 38 to 42 weeks. And I say, I block my calendar and do nothing with my life from 30, right. 42 weeks. But if I want to go see my daughter, if I want to take a class in Vegas and I fly there for a weekend, I have to be able to plan my life around everyone else's pregnancies. Um, 100%. If, if you're going to labor before that and you call me, I'm going to do everything I can to get there. But this is for me blocking out my calendar and having a life, you know. Um, right. I, because I think that one pregnant woman doesn't realize how much of our lives we, we don't, I don't put anything on hold exactly, but you have to do things in a way that you're very aware. Absolutely. You have to reschedule yeah. a lot. I rescheduled our podcast cause I was at a 43 hour birth. I mean, like that's just the normal part of your life. It is. Yeah. I had to get a mammogram rescheduled. Things happen. Yeah. And I am with you. I still drive two vehicles. I have my birth bag in the car. If I have Mm -hmm. a client with signs and I've had to leave in the middle of, you know, dinner or events with friends, 
holiday party, even doing the shared call model that I have, I mean, it's still um, unpredictable. And clients, as you mentioned, can go into labor five weeks early, or you know, they can hit that forty-two week mark. You just don't know. So it, unless, even with a, a scheduled birth, things can happen before that date. So yes. And with scheduled births, I mean, we've talked about some of this, but when we were visiting earlier before the podcast, you know, a scheduled birth and induction, when people are like, oh, I'm being induced, like that makes it so much easier for my schedule. It's a 48 to 72 hour gig. Right. And yes. I'm not there the whole time. So I tell them, I'll show up when you get to the hospital, get you settled, see where you're at, make sure what the what is the plan, have conversations, because we've already talked about this, but now we're here. And right. then if you're getting site attack or cervidil on your cervix, I'm going home. Absolutely. I, I, like, there's I'm no not reason gonna, to be watching. I'm just gonna <laughs> sit and stare going at on. you. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing happening. And I'm like, you know, that's when the mental game is huge for the client. And I think you really need to support them in those situations where it's longer and more drawn out. Um, like this is gonna be a mental game. Bring card games, bring Netflix, bring like bring stuff to do because it's not like being at home for 48 hours. This is in one room being monitored. So we really, we really have to manipulate our schedules on a very regular basis. And it's worth it. And I love it. And you love it. But I don't think people realize what it means to be on call for four to five weeks for four or five clients a month. And, you know, I have a daughter who's pregnant and she lives in Kansas and she's due in April. And for oh, me wow. to take, it is, it's great. I'm thrilled. And for me to go there for two weeks, I lose clients for six. I have to block Absolutely. off six weeks to, so I turned down five clients just to go to her for two weeks. It's not, wow. you what know, move for her. Oh, I love it. It's so great. I love going for grandkids, but you know, it's, it's tough to schedule things for us. Why right. did you, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer. You still do birth 60 mile. I totally get that. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. There's only a certain amount you can travel on top right. of being on call. Your focus on postpartum and what that looks like and getting word out. Cause you're right. A lot of people don't know there are doulas period, but postpartum is a completely different segment and it, and it works differently. Right. Why did you focus so much on that? How did you get word out? How has that worked for you guys in the shared? And I want to hear more about the shared model um, for being on call and traveling and how you do that. Okay. So as far as the education, pre-pandemic, um, we would speak in person wherever we possibly could. Mm. So we would speak in you know, other childbirth education classes, and of course our own. Um, we would talk to personal trainers groups and present to pelvic floor physical therapist offices and, you know, create relationships with midwives and physical therapists, anyone who is working in the birth and baby space. I met with a local baby store and they added us to their registry for not only oh. postpartum doulas, but also birth. And that was an early relationship. And then I would speak, they had these mom um, get togethers and I would speak at them on different topics, like creating your birth plan or what self-care truly can be for you in the postnatal phase. And um, so there was a lot of that in addition to launching the podcast in 2017, which at that time, I only interviewed local experts mm -hmm. in the birth and baby space in our office. And then with the pandemic and everything going virtual, I expanded Ask the Doulas to include national experts um, like yourself in the birth and baby space and authors and thought leaders. And so mm -hmm. I was able to expand that a bit, but we were creating relationships within our community. And my business has held a diaper drive oh. from the very start as part of our give back. And since we don't offer free bursts or sliding scale, we yeah. do a lot of community give backs and 
um, not only with our time, but also financially to different charities supporting low-income women and children. So our diaper drive involves area businesses and they are collection spots for our drive that is a month long. And it goes along with National Diaper Needs Awareness Week. So it just ended this year. We I haven't announced it publicly yet because we just got the numbers from the diaper bank, but we collected 14,910 diapers wow. and 68 packages of wipes. And our goal was 15,000. So we just missed it, but we collected just over 13,000 the year prior. Mm -hmm. And so we have um, a physical therapy practice that has 12 offices that participate in the drive, um, two different baby stores, a chiropractic office that does Webster and pediatric chiropractic, yep. and then a mental health practice that has three offices, um, also collects diapers for us. So creating those strong relationships yep. and doing good together has really helped us to spread the word. Um, about the importance of the work we do, how we can help families. And we've also worked on insurance coverage for um, all doula support, but especially postpartum doula support. So around 2019, we had worked with an area construction company and added doulas to their benefits and created presentations and we're going to HR departments and to insurance companies before there was progeny and carrot fertility and some of the benefits that are now offered for birth and postpartum doulas. We were working on coverage for doulas and Medicaid is new to Michigan. It's been about a year and a half. So yeah, we've had a lot of pro progress there and I feel like we are you know, we're starting to move the needle forward. Sur sur excuse me, surrogacy is now legal in Michigan. So okay. that's fairly new. Um, you've had uh, on your podcast, I was scrolling down the guests and you had Anna Rodney, who was the woman I took my Kappa birth doula training through. I didn't need it, but I wanted to be a TRICARE provider. And TRICARE yeah. only accepts five. So I was like, well, I have to take another birth doula training to comply with TRICARE. And she was there. Anna was on your pod. I was like, I know her. So That's the, amazing, birth world, yeah, the birth world is like, you know, when I scroll down your podcast and I see the pictures and I know some of them, it's because we're, <laughs> we're a pretty tight knit group. It's not a massive amount of people and there's so much crossover. And I feel yes. like we really want, like, I'm always like, we, we have Medicaid. The Doula Co-op of Nevada here is a nonprofit that did legislation for Medicaid. So where we were getting paid $350, we now get paid $1,300. And our going yeah. rate in the area was $1,500. So it was comparable. That's um, great. So Medicaid, TRICARE, and they just raised their rates. Um, you know, so, I mean, I think doula work in the nation is getting more exposure and we're not the answer to everything sometimes things come out and i'm like whoa whoa we're not like curing maternal issues no. we can go a long way and we really like to connect with each other you know so what you're doing in michigan when we when i hear about it i think huh so in my climate and where i live and what it's like here how could where's the crossover we don't all need to reinvent the wheel you know no so absolutely. it's so it's so great the diaper drive and i believe in community resources like i just said earlier we yeah. become this resource right especially with medicaid clients who don't even know what's out there they don't know what's possible or what's covered mental health is covered for them and it's giving them yeah. the list of these are the things that you can utilize for your pregnancy and postpartum and your baby. And I have this huge comprehensive list. And that, for me, that's come from going and meeting people in the community and establishing like real relationships where we actually yeah. physically meet, you know? So I love, I love that you're doing that. You found a way to continue to do what you love in a way that makes sense for you. So you're not necessarily tied down all the time to one place and focusing on postpartum. That's amazing. Right. 
I feel like new doulas um, believe that social media will get them everything from clients to connections. And there's nothing like an in-person relationship and connection. And so there are so many virtual Zooms and trainings, but I am all about that yeah. one-to-one in-person connection. Whenever possible, I absolutely am as well. Even if, you know, it, once you do that once and you have a, you know, the person better, you know, I've met you, we hugged, we, we, I know your body language differently. After right. that, I don't mind doing things virtually or on the phone or text me, but that initial communication when you really have a relationship with someone is pretty amazing. So I'm, yes. I'm glad that you mentioned how much you focus on that. Also, it's just like building a website just because you have a website and you're a doula doesn't mean anyone's going to find it. You know, no. I mean, there's SEO and yes, and uh, doing these collaborations, getting media. So the diaper drive has given us a lot of attention. Yes from the media and allowed us to spotlight our partners. I'm able to bring on, you know, the yoga studio into a TV interview with me. And so we're creating an even stronger partnership. I love that. I think that's so important. I'm glad that like, if we're talking about doulas having their own business, social media is important. It's not that it's not important. People right. find me that way, but there are so many other ways to reach out. Um, yeah. And I, I, the diaper drive is perfect. Yeah. You get a lot of community support. You're getting your information put out. You're putting out other people's information. I love referral partners. They're probably my favorite. What advice would you get? Well, geez, there's so many things I could ask you right now to kind of tie it up in a bow. I guess what advice would you give to new aspiring doulas, but also that mom on her first time that's looking for something? So for new and aspiring doulas, I would say, you know, collaborate over feeling like doulas are your competition. Oh. Many of us get books. So new doulas can, you know, back up more experienced doulas or, um, you know, learn from them. And there's the more doulas there are, the more people know about doulas, as long as they're having positive experiences, mm -hmm. I see no harm in, you know, having 20 more doulas in my area, as long as they're in scope and not causing problems within the medical community. Yeah. But yes. Yeah, so collaborate and, you know, get to know other professionals and keep learning. Like you mentioned, even though you're a seasoned doula going to trainings, I'm all about continuing my education. And I bring in trainings to my team of doulas. We brought in a trainer for supporting plus size um, clients and then have worked with our Michigan Disability Coalition and had a training on disability. So every year we try to, um, you know, bring in specific trainers, but also take advantage because Michigan again has Medicaid trainings for doulas that are free on everything from, you know, equity to, um, you know, breastfeeding trainings. And so we're, even though my agency does not accept to Medicaid, um, we are, working as a referral source for doulas who do accept it and learning, taking advantage of some of those free learning opportunities and connecting with the community that way as an agency owner, it just, it wasn't, um, an easy process for me to get all of the doulas credentialed. They weren't all interested as contractors and going through the process to be registered with every insurance group. So we yeah. decided, as a practice that we would focus more on postpartum doulas and we're busy with birth, but that was an area that other doulas could focus on in mm -hmm. our area. Awesome. What about that mom? We've both been that mom that didn't have enough support. So you don't have to do it alone. Ask for help. And if you aren't interested in hiring a postpartum doula, 
you know, that you could look into meal delivery service or a diaper mm -hmm. service, a housekeeper, or, you know, during pregnancy, be very direct and specific about how your friends and family can help you. Because if this is your first baby, it's all you're being celebrated during pregnancy and your, you know, gifts are being given and there's a lot about you, but then you have this baby and everyone wants to hold the baby. They bring gifts for the baby. And then the mother often fe feels neglected yeah, and that no one wants to process the birth or talk to her about how she's mentally or physically doing. And so ask for help. And realize that no matter if this is your first baby or your fifth, you're going through a major life occurrence journey and that you don't have to be superwoman. You already are, but ask for help. Yeah, I agree. Kristen, thank you so much for being on it. I love talking to other birth workers. It makes me so thrilled. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you, Jennifer, and the work you're doing.